race for the White House. President Donald Trump is holding a campaign rally tonight in North Carolina. We're on the ground talking to voters, plus a preview of tomorrow's Super Tuesday primaries. Vatican Archives. It is the first day for historians to view previously private documents regarding Pope Pius XII. We're in Rome. Deadly outbreak. How Catholic churches around the world are reacting to the coronavirus. And a new chapter. A first ever visual look at the origins of the Knights of Columbus, the world's largest Catholic fraternal organization. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, March 2nd, 2020. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. The 2020 presidential campaign starts this week with three less Democratic candidates. This afternoon, Amy Klobuchar decided to suspend her campaign and endorse former Vice President Joe Biden. On Sunday, former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg ended his run. And now Biden is hoping to catch Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders tomorrow on Super Tuesday. Amy Klobuchar announced she is ending her run for the White House. Over the weekend, Pete Buttigieg said he is bowing out as well. I am making the difficult decision to suspend my campaign for the presidency. The former mayor's unlikely bid started last year in South Bend, Indiana, with a staff of four. No big email lists, no personal fortune. Hardly anybody knew my name and even fewer could pronounce it. But that changed over time. I will do everything in my power to ensure that we have a new Democratic president come January. President Trump took to Twitter to say Buttigieg's exit gives former Vice President Joe Biden a boost, especially after winning the primary in South Carolina. We've won big because of you. The 77-year-old Biden notched his first ever nominating contest win more than three decades after he launched the first of his three campaigns for the White House. Biden is hoping to cast himself as the clear moderate alternative to progressive Bernie Sanders. Sanders leads the Democratic presidential delegate count so far, followed by Biden and Elizabeth Warren is in third place. And we'll have more analysis later in the show with resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Tim Carney. President Donald Trump will rally his supporters tonight in North Carolina, a key swing state that he would like to win in November. Voters there and in several other states head to the polls tomorrow in a huge primary contest known as Super Tuesday. And pro-lifers are showing their support for the president. Correspondent Owen Jensen reports now from the president's rally in Charlotte, North Carolina. Owen. Tracy, good evening. We're here at Bojangles Coliseum in North Carolina, where tonight President Trump is rallying his supporters. Now, earlier I stood in line with many of them who told me they have one main reason. They want the president to stay in the Oval Office. Another Trump rally, this time in Charlotte. The lines long, the mood energetic. For some, this isn't their first rodeo. How many is this for you? This is number 67. And what is it like to be first in front of all of these people? Just ask Sharon Anderson. Oh, it's always fun. Whether you're number one or number 5,000 or 80,000, it's your, always fun. Is it your first Trump rally? No, sir. It's my 10th. 10? Yes. Trump supporters love the crowds. They love the energy. They love the camaraderie. But for some, there's one big issue that really makes them support Trump. And it, like, says a lot about somebody. Like, he's, like, one of the only presidents that has like been pro-life. And I think abortion is a euphemism for murder. In fact, several Trump supporters we spoke with told us Trump's pro-life support is very important to them. It's very important. I think every life is important. And I think children in the womb don't get to make that decision and it should not be made for them. Yes, that is like one of my number one things, I think. Um, I think that abortion is a sin, honestly. And Ronald Solomon, busy today selling his Trump stuff, supports Trump's pro-life stance as well. Trump is an incredible leader. He has a way of connecting with people. Uh, he's, he, he, he's like a man of the people. He speaks their, their language, and he's doing great things for our country. For Trump, no doubt his pro-life position will translate into votes come November. He supports, you know, being more pro-life. Uh, more, um, most of abortions are black babies. It's up to God. Yeah. He decides. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the sanctity of life. Now, we did not have to look long or hard to find Trump supporters who are also pro-lifers, many from different faith backgrounds, 
all believing that children in the womb need to be protected. Tracy. All right. Thank you, Owen. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court is going to decide on the fate of Obamacare. An appeals court had found it unconstitutional. This will be the third time the high court will hear a lawsuit that threatens the health care law. But a final decision will probably not happen until after the elections this fall. The Vatican opens its archives on the pontificate of Pope Pius XII, which includes historical documents from World War II. Today, the Vatican Archive hosted more than 100 researchers and scholars to examine around 2 million documents. It took archivists over 14 years to prepare for the release. This gives historians an insight into Pope Pius XII's nearly two-decade pontificate, as well as the Holy See's political and diplomatic decisions during an intense time in history. Johan Eeks, historical archivist of the Section for Relation of States for the Secretary of State, joins us now from Rome. Johan, thank you so much for joining us. So what do you expect historians will find in these archives? Well, uh, in the archives, uh, firstly, they, in our archives, they will find, anyway, the political diplomatical history behind it uh, of the war and after war and the Cold War. So uh, three moments, basic moments in, 19th, in 20th century history. Uh, very important also for America because America comes for the first time uh, with an acquaintance, a contact with the Holy See in the 40s uh, with the special envoy of the President Roosevelt to the Holy See and Myron Taylor. And uh, it uh, sounds really as a new uh, chapter in history. Well, Johan, critics say that Pope Pius XII was silent during the Holocaust. What did you find? Is that true? Uh, anyone, uh, everybody's questioning, of course, that. And um, I can tell you that in our archives, we have a series on Jews, and the Jews were helped by him. Uh, there were requests from all over Europe. These requests were not known until now. There were also very famous names between them, like uh, Paul Oscar Christeller, the famous Renaissance scholar who went then to America. There are also Liebman, uh, a professor of process law, uh, who later on came back to Italy and became uh, world famous on, in this field. Uh, these people were helped as young scholars to get out of Europe. Um, and these are only two of them because many others asked for help and got it. I know another issue that arises in the archives is the Vatican Ostpolitik, uh, the dialogue and concessions that took place with Soviet countries. Based on your knowledge, did Pope Pius XII seek out dialogue with Soviet countries? Yes, many times it's said that uh, Pope Pius didn't love so much the communists and he didn't even want to speak with them. But uh, I think the opposite is true. Um, we will see that in these archives, uh, attempts to get into dialogue with the Soviets after the war will be there to be found. Find. Uh, and also uh, there are several secret missions also from Jesuit fathers to Budapest and other cities uh, in the East uh, countries uh, to get in acquaintance and in contact with the communists. Well, Johan, thank you so much for your insight. Johan Eeks, historical archivist of the Section for Relation of States for the Secretary of State. Thank you again. Thank you. Apollo Francis says to never engage in dialogue with the devil. Gesù non dialoga col diavolo. At the Sunday gathering, the Holy Father said the devil likes to mix his voice with others to entice us and tame our conscience. This illusion draws us away from God and will make us feel defenseless when facing large problems. During the Lenten season, Pope Francis encouraged us to respond to temptations with God's word and not our own, asking Our Lady for help. The president of Argentina wants to legalize voluntary abortion. Alberto Fernandez announced yesterday that he is sending the proposal to Congress. Argentina, the home of Pope Francis, rejected an initiative to legalize abortion two years ago after resistance from the church and conservatives. Six people in the United States have now died from the coronavirus, and the number of new cases worldwide is rising, along with fears of a weakening global economy. But international stock markets are not falling. Central banks are promising to step in with stimulus spending.
In France, the Archbishop of Paris is telling priests to place communion wafers in people's hands, not their mouths. He also ordered holy water fonts be emptied. A priest in Paris tested positive for the virus yesterday. After returning from Italy and Mexico, much of the same thing, with some people shaking hands, but most just nodding and offering a sign of peace and receiving communion in hands. Today is election day in Israel, and the prime minister tells people to hit the polls. Go vote. Go vote. It's a proud day. This is a democracy. Uh, you have a, a great right that you should exercise. Benjamin Netanyahu, along with his wife, cast their ballots in Jerusalem. He is the longest-serving leader in Israeli history, but faces a strong challenge in today's ballot. Election Day is a national holiday in Israel, and 15 polling stations were sent up for the hundreds of people who were quarantined due to the coronavirus. In India, the number of people killed in the worst religious violence in decades is now up to 46. Tensions boiled over between Hindus and Muslims last week, but false rumors of new religious riots are still causing panic and calls to police in the capital of Delhi. Mobs attacked and burned shops, mosques and schools last week in a dispute over a new citizenship law. North Korea reportedly fired two missiles, the first provocation in months. People in South Korea watched a TV screen showing news of the launch. Two projectiles landed in the sea off to North Korea overnight. South Korea's military is not saying how far they flew or if the missiles were ballistic or rocket artillery. North Korea has not conducted any testing in months, but leader Kim Jong-un says he is no longer bound to a suspension of nuclear and missile testing. Coming up... An update on the future of Obamacare. And a recap of a big weekend for former Vice President Joe Biden. Tomorrow is a big day on the primary calendar for the Democratic candidates for president. Nearly one-third of all the delegates at July's Democratic National Convention are up for grabs. Former Vice President Joe Biden is hoping to build on the momentum of his primary victory in South Carolina over the weekend. Yesterday, Biden tried to cast himself as the clear moderate alternative to progressive Bernie Sanders. The senator from Vermont remains the front runner. Earlier, he rallied thousands of supporters in California, which is considered the crown jewel of Super Tuesday, with 415 delegates up for grabs. Joining me now to take a look at all this is Tim Carney, resident fellow at the American Inst en Enterprise Institute, that is, and author of the book Alienated America, Why Some Places Thrive While Others Collapse. Tim, welcome back to the show. I know you're just back from South Carolina. What do you make of former Vice President Joe Biden's victory there? It was a huge victory. He didn't just win. He won by a massive margin and clearly established himself as the candidate, not just sort of the moderate candidate, but the non-Bernie Sanders candidate, which is to say the non-radical candidate. A lot of what I found out there was older voters, lots of older black voters, that's half of the South Carolina Democratic electorate, who just said they like change. They like the fact that Obama changed so much, but they don't want big, rapid change. They want a sort of steady pace. They see Biden as a steadying force, just as they see Sanders and Trump as disruptive forces. Tim, uh, what did the Democratic voters that you talked to in South Carolina, what did they have to say about faith, and did it have much influence on who they voted for? I think it definitely did influence that who they voted for. Joe Biden is comfortable walking into churches, black churches, uh, white churches, etc. He is a Catholic, but he walks into Protestant black churches, and he begins with, a, the whole thing begins with a prayer. He, uh, I talked to many voters who said they like uh, candidates to put their faith into what they're saying and to talk about their own experience, even if it's a totally different faith experience. So again, a white Catholic from the East Coast, uh, I mean, from Pennsylvania and Delaware going down to a black Baptist church in the South, two very different experiences. But when Biden says, here's how my upbringing and my faith affected me, that really resonates. Bernie Sanders is not someone who talks about faith. He has said he's basically secular, and he does not campaign in churches for the most part. And I think in South Carolina, where most of the Democratic voters go to church at least once a week, 
many of them twice, that that uh, aversion to churches really hurt Sanders. Yeah, in your book, uh, Alienated America, you examine the factors that contributed to President Trump's win. Um, for the Washington Examiner, I know you take a look at the similarities between the kind of voters who supported the president four years ago and those who are now supporting Senator Sanders. What stands out the most to you? If you look at the exit polls, most almost every group voted for Joe Biden in South Carolina. Two that voted for Sanders were people who have not gone to college and people who do not ever go to church or synagogue or mosque. This was basically true in New Hampshire as well, where those who didn't attend any religious ceremonies basically ever were Sanders' main base. And so there's lots of ways to look at it. But what I argue in Alienated America, what I think is true here, is that it's the people who are not attached to institutions, who don't belong to something. They're looking for the revolution that Sanders is promising. This is similar to the earliest people who came out for Donald Trump before anybody else, over Ted Cruz, over Kasich, over Rubio, et cetera. They were people who said, finally, there's something I can belong to, a movement I can join, because they were, again, not the people who voted for him in the general election in November 2016 over Hillary, but the first people to come to rally to Trump were similarly people who didn't belong to other things and were looking for something to join, some movement to be part of. Well, Jim, quickly, tomorrow's Super Tuesday. It's a big day with more than 1,300 delegates up for grabs. What are you keeping your eye on tomorrow? Well, now that uh, Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg has dropped out, it's much easier for Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and maybe Michael Bloomberg to clear the 15 percent viability threshold that Democrats have, basically to win some delegates. So I think Bernie Sanders is going to win more delegates than Joe Biden on Super Tuesday. But if Biden can keep it close, then we're really going to have it neck and neck going down the stretch. But if Bernie runs away and comes away with a 200 net gain, 200 delegate net gain, then it might be all but over. All right, Tim, thank you so much for your time and analysis. We appreciate it. Thank you. A police in California shoot an armed man inside of a church yesterday afternoon. It happened inside the Immaculate Heart of Mary Church in Santa Ana. The Orange County Register is reporting that officers were flagged down and told that someone in the church had a gun. Police found that man and shot him at the altar. He then ran outside with a gun and collapsed on a street nearby. Police are still investigating that shooting. Up next, a new book details the history of the Knights of Columbus. And a rare honor for a church in Michigan. We'll explain. It is the second oldest continually operating parish in the country, and now St. Anne Church in Detroit, Michigan, is a minor basilica. The honor, which was approved by Pope Francis, was announced yesterday. The parish was founded in 1701 by French missionaries two days after the founding of Detroit. The current church was built in the 1880s. Basil basilicas signify a close relationship with the Pope and often hold special honor as pilgrimage sites. A new book about the Knights of Columbus is providing a first ever visual look at the origins of the world's largest Catholic fraternal organization. The Knights of Columbus, an illustrated history, combines photos and copies of historic records to document the evolution of the organization, whose membership now numbers close to two million Catholic men around the world. Andrew Walther, Vice President of Communications for the Knights of Columbus, as well as the book's co-author, joins me now. Andrew, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. So there have been a lot of histories written about the Knights of Columbus. How is this book different? And I know it's kind of groundbreaking. Well, it's different because, first, it's the first history of the organization in almost four decades. And second, it's the first ever illustrated history. So we have an enormous archive with more than 100,000 assets in terms of digital uh, photos, hard copy photos, et cetera. And taking some of the best of the best of those and putting them into this book, as well as having the running narrative in the text, I think added a dimension. If a picture is worth a 1,000 words, I wouldn't want to estimate the number of words in the book. But it's, it's really, I think, quite engaging and a real look behind the curtain through these pictures at what was going on in the history of the organization as it touched so many different aspects of American and world history. Absolutely. We were thumbing through it earlier in just beautiful pictures as well, the illustrations. So really great book. Well, thank you very much. I, I think, again, in 140 years, more or less, the Knights of Columbus has done 
some really incredible things. It's touched on history in ways that are unique. It was groundbreaking in terms of its racial outreach, for example. It was groundbreaking in terms of some of the work it did on religious freedom in the United States and Catholic civil rights. It was groundbreaking in helping to pioneer the USO, both with what we did in World War I and actually pioneering it with the USO in World War II. So there's just so many aspects of, of what the Knights have done historically that what we're doing now is built upon and what the future after today will continue to look back to and be built upon. I, I think bringing that all together was, was really a joy and a privilege. What surprised you most when you were researching and writing this book? I think the breadth and scope of what the Knights have done is, is really phenomenal because you have the national level policies, you have the major issues that have been taken up by the organization as a whole, but you also have the individual lives that are touched. So you have this combination of no job is too big and no job is too small for the Knights of Columbus. And I think that was, was very, very interesting. Also, I think very interesting was the importance of faith at the foundation of the Knights of Columbus, that Father McGivney was concerned about his men leaving the faith for social advancement or financial advancement. And he was also concerned about the families of widows and orphans, which is a story most people know. But part of that concern was that when a family split up, they ended up in a state-run institution, which probably was not, what certainly was not Catholic. They ended up with relatives who may not have been Catholic. And there was also a very early concern about making sure that Catholics were able to maintain the equal rights that the U.S. Constitution promised them in an era where anti-Catholicism was quite strong. So I think that unique combination of things has lent itself to an organization that was groundbreaking and history-making in the 20th century and into the 21st. As far as religious freedom, uh, let's talk about, you know, we touched on how important it was back then from the beginning and, and how it is still today. Well, you know, the Knights of Columbus have focused both domestically and internationally. So domestically, the Knights did things like take on the KKK when it tried to ban Catholic education in the state of Oregon. And so the Knights funded Pierce versus Society of Sisters, which was the case that ultimately overturned the Klan-inspired law outlawing Catholic education in that state. The Knights also spoke out internationally. We spoke out against anti-Catholic policies that the U.S. government was engaging in in the Philippines and Cuba before the turn of the 20th century. We spoke out against the French secularism law of 1905. We helped the Mexican Catholics in the 1920s, the Armenian Christians in the 1920s. And of course today, this work continues as it did during World War II, as it did during the Cold War. Now with the support for Christians in the Middle East and, and persecuted Christians, this continues, as does our work standing for the religious freedom and Catholic civil rights of, of people at home through you know any number of uh, projects here in the United States as well. Andrew, quickly, tell us what would you like readers to take away from this book? I think I would like readers to take away from this book what can happen, A, through the Knights of Columbus. When, when men join the Knights of Columbus, when they get involved, when they get their families involved, they can do really incredible things at the local level, at the state level, at the national level. I think I'd also like people to take away from this what happens when you put faith into action. You know, the gospel talks about where two or three are gathered. This is an example of that precisely. It's paying dividends that continue to impact our world as we live in it today and as we will live in it tomorrow. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for your time. Can't wait to read rest, the rest of this book, and it is due for release March 9th. March 9th, it's available for pre-order now at knightsgear.com forward slash history. There's a nice discount on it for the time being, and I look forward to having people take a look and learn a little more. Wonderful. Thank you again, Andrew. Thank you. And we'd like to thank the Knights of Columbus for its support of EWTN News Nightly, and we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We're back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night, and God bless.